Today we are going to study the message to the church of Thyatira. This is the fourth church that we find in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We are going to study this church in two parts. Because this is the longest message, because the church covers the longest period. So what we're going to do first is have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to read the passage, and from the very start I'm going to give you an interpretation of the passage, so that you know exactly where we're going. And then as we study the parts, everything will come together. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. We thank you for the sure word of prophecy, which tells us where we came from, why we are here, and how things will end. We ask that as we study this important message to the church of Thyatira, that your spirit will be, will be with us to teach us the lessons that we need to learn. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation chapter 2 and we are going to read verses 18 through 29 and as I mentioned we are going to interpret the meaning of uh, this message as we go along. So I begin reading at verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. By the way, this is not said of the entire church, it's said of the remnant within this church. We continue, once again verse 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. In other words, the last uh, part of the period of this church uh, is characterized by what we just read. Verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce. In other words, she, teaches, she seduces by her teaching. To teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. A better translation would be to commit fornication. And of course she fornicated with the kings of the earth. This is spiritual fornication because we're not talking about literal Jezebel. So once again, verse 20, Nevertheless I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce, that is seduce through her teaching, my servants to commit sexual immorality or fornication, and eat things sacrificed to idols, which is idolatry. Verse 21, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality or fornication, and she did not repent. The time that God gave this church to repent was time times and the dividing of time. 1260 years, we're going to notice that. Verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. That's speaking about the deadly wound that this church received because it did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery or fornication with her, that is the kings of the earth, into great tribulation. The great tribulation is the French Revolution, unless they repent of their deeds. And then in verse 23 it says, I will kill her children with death. So this harlot Jezebel has children, and the children are going to suffer the same fate as the mother. And of course the children represent apostate Protestants who were born from the papacy in the 16th century and on. So verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know, this is in the judgment, that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. In other words, Jesus is going to perform a righteous judgment. And then uh, you'll notice it continues saying, I will give to each one of you according to your works. Verse 24, now to you I say and to the rest. That word rest 
uh, is not the best translation. It's the Greek word loipos, which means the remnant. It's the same word that appears in Revelation 12, 17, where it says that the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. In other words, this is talking about a faithful remnant in the church of Thyatira. So once again, verse 24, Now to you I say, and to the remnant in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, in other words, those who do not follow Jezebel, who have not known the depths of Satan, which is a description of the religion of Jezebel, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. And then comes the counsel of Jesus. But hold fast what you have until I come. Now comes the promise. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He, this is talking about Jesus, shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star, that is, the church of Thyatira would get the morning star. Verse 29, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's a bird's eye view of the sequence of events that we find in the message to the church of Thyatira. Now let's say a few things about the city of Thyatira. It helps us understand the description that is given of Jesus at the beginning of this message. The name Thyatira means sacrifice of contrition. Interesting because during this period the, the sacrifice of the sanctuary was trampled, trampled underfoot as we're going to notice. Now of all the cities in the Roman Empire Thyatira had the most organized labor force. It had trade guilds, which we call today labor unions. Two of the most powerful labor unions were the textile dyers and the guild or the labor uh, of the coppersmiths. Thyatira was renowned for its fabric dyeing business. In fact, the color that it was most famous for was royal purple. That's the reason why in Acts chapter 16 and verse 14 it speaks about Lydia, one of the church members in the early church, who was a seller of purple and she was from Thyatira. We'll find that this color purple is very significant because it is the color that is worn by the harlot of Revelation chapter 17, which is the final fulfillment of the Jezebel prophecy. Thyatira also had expert coppersmiths who manufactured instruments of brass and of copper. In this context, it's important that Jesus in the introduction to this church is introduced as having eyes of fire and feet of fine brass. In fact, let's read that as we find it in Revelation 2 and verse 18. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, you know coppersmiths would obviously uh, need very powerful fire in order to perform their work, and then it says, and his feet like fine brass. Now what is meant by the eyes of Jesus that are like eyes of fire? It means that Jesus sees and examines everything that happens in the history of the church. During this church, God's people were slaughtered and persecuted by Jezebel, by spiritual Jezebel. And it looked like the evil ones won and the righteous lost. But Jesus is saying to this church, someday there will be a judgment. And in the judgment, I am going to reverse the unjust sentences that have been pronounced against my people. I want to read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White links the eyes of fire with the idea of Jesus performing a righteous judgment. This statement is found, interestingly enough, in pamphlet 028, uh, which is a letter that Ellen White wrote to Elder Daniels and the Fresno Church. It's page 2. This is how it reads. 
he whose eyes are as a flame of fire is searching every church in the world. His gaze is piercing every heart. He is measuring the temple and the worshipers thereof, weighing all their actions in the golden scales of heaven and registering the result in the books of record. Do you see how the eyes are connected with the idea of judgment here? She continues, all things are open to the eye of him with whom we have to do. He is a discerner of the thoughts and intents and purposes of the heart. No deed of darkness. Was there darkness during the church of Thyatira? You better believe it. Did it look like uh, the Thyatiran church uh, came out pretty well during this period? Oh, it, it appeared so. God's people were slaughtered and Jezebel, she did fine. But notice once again what it says. All things are open to the eye of him with whom we have to do. He is a discerner of the thoughts and intents and purposes of the heart. No deed of darkness can be screened from his view. Sin, undetected by man, unsuspected by human minds, is noted and registered by the great heart searcher. Jesus saw what was happening in Thyatira. And even though the sentences pronounced by Jezebel were wrong, Jesus is saying, I saw what happened and I will make things right in the judgment. Now there was also a commendation that Jesus gave to the church of Thyatira. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19, we find that uh, commendation or that approval of Jesus of something that the remnant was doing in the church of Thyatira. Obviously, this does not apply to the apostate people in Thyatira. It applies to the remnant that we read about at the beginning of our study together. Revelation 2 verse 19 says, I know your works, of course, because he has eyes of fire. Nothing can be hidden from him. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. This undoubtedly is talking about certain faithful people during this period, like the Waldenses, who hid in the Piedmont from the persecutions of the Roman church. It also would apply to the Albigenses and other groups who were faithful to God's word. They actually wrote Bible verses on pieces of parchment and they were merchants and they would take these little uh, parchments with verses from the Bible and they would give them to people that they did business with because the Bible was forbidden during this period, during this Jezebel period. So the commendation is not generally for the entire church of Thyatira because it would be wrong for God to approve of all of the things that Jezebel did. It has to do with the remnant. They were loving they served the Lord, they had great faith, and they had patience, or perseverance would be a better translation. But then we find that Jesus rebukes the church of Thyatira. In Revelation chapter 2, and verses 20 to 23, we find the rebuke, and this is what we're going to dedicate most of our time to in our study. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 through 23 says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce, by the way, she seduces through her teaching, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. Sexual immorality would be fornication, and of course, the harlot is fornicating with the kings of the earth. We're going to see that when we look at the background uh, that in the Old Testament on Jezebel. So once again, nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, she introduces fornication and she introduces idolatry. Now, we remember that when we studied about the church of Pergamum, in Pergamum the church began to compromise. 
It allowed the world to come into the church. It embraced and adopted many pagan practices into the Christian church during the period of Constantine. During the period of the church of Thyatira, what had just come into the church during the church of Pergamum now became open apostasy. In other words, everything that the church embraced during the period of compromise of Pergamum now bore fruit in the church of, uh, church of Thyatira, and the church of Thyatira now became openly apostate. I want to read a couple of statements here from the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White makes it absolutely clear that the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire actually bequeathed its power to the Roman Catholic Papacy. Just like we, we studied in our last lecture that Pergamum is the link between pagan Rome and papal Rome. I want to read from Great Controversy, page 50, first of all. This compromise, she's talking about the period of Constantine of the Roman Empire, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. So you see the, the connection between uh, paganism and Rome and the papacy. She says the compromise during the times of Constantine between paganism and Christianity resulted in the next stage, which would be Thyatira, and the full development of the man of sin. I would also like to read from Great Controversy pages 54 and 55. This one is even more explicit. In the 6th century, that would be the year 538 is the 6th century, in the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Notice in the days of Constantine it was not firmly established. In the, in the church of Pergamum the papacy was not firmly established. Apostasy was incipient into the church, but it had not become full-blown. She continues, its seat, that is the seat of the papacy, Thyatira, its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Now listen to this. Paganism, that's Pergamum, had given place to the papacy, that's Thyatira. The dragon, pagan Rome, had given to the beast, papal Rome, Thyatira, his power and his seat and great authority. And now began, says Ellen White, this is the period of Thyatira, now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. And then she mentions Daniel 7.25 and Revelation chapter 13 and verses 5 through 7. You know the Roman Catholic papacy actually admits, as we noted in our last study, that she adopted pagan practices and Christianized them, so to speak. In other words, during the church of Pergamum, she embraced from the pagan Roman Empire many of the practices, and then in the next stage, she became a full-blown harlot. I want to read you a statement from the 20th century Encyclopedia of Catholicism. This is volume 88, page 85, where it's admitted what the papacy did, embraced all kinds of traditions and practices from paganism. This is how it reads. The missionary history of the church clearly shows her adaptability to all races, all continents, all nations. In her liturgy, that is her worship style, in her liturgy, liturgy and her art, in her traditions and the forming of her doctrine, Naturally enough, she includes Jewish elements, but also elements that are of pagan origin. In a certain respect, she has copied her organization from that of the Roman Empire. 
has preserved and made fruitful the philosophical intuitions of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, borrowed both from the barbarians and the Byzantine Roman Empire, but always remains herself, thoroughly digesting all elements drawn from external sources. Notice, from external, not from the Bible, but from external sources. The quotation continues, in her laws, her ceremonies, her festivals, and her devotions, she makes use of local customs after purifying them and baptizing them. This adaptation of pagan customs, says Fry Sertelange, prudently regulated, allows for the utilization of instincts and sentiments that preserve local traditions and so lends powerful aid to the furthering of the gospel. The church's cultus of saints and martyrs is a helpful substitute and replaces popular divinities in the minds of the populace. Isn't that an amazing statement by the Roman Catholic Church? They say, yeah, we embraced all kinds of things from different religions. We embrace things from the Byzantines, you know, from the pagan Roman Empire. We embrace things from the barbarians. We embrace things from the Jews. You know, we got all of these things. We baptized them, and they became part of the church. No mention, of course, that this church followed what the Bible says you're supposed to follow. No, they just embraced things from the surrounding cultures. Now, you'll notice that in this story, the central figure is a person called Jezebel. So if Jezebel is mentioned, we need to take a look at Jezebel. But before we do, I would like to mention something about the structure of the book of Revelation. Let's take, first of all, Daniel as an example. Daniel 2 is the foundational prophecy of Daniel. Daniel 7 builds on Daniel 2. Daniel 8 and 9 builds on Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Daniel 11 and 12 builds on Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8 and 9. In other words, in each uh, succeeding context you have an amplification of the original prophecy which is the foundation and basis or the skeleton upon which everything else builds. I have discovered, and I don't have time to really get into this because it would take me probably two or three hours to demonstrate it, but I'm just going to throw out the idea. I have discovered that the seven churches that cover from the apostolic church all the way to the end of time actually are to Revelation what Daniel 2 is to the book of Daniel. In other words, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches, give us the structure of everything else that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. It puts all of the chrono chronology in order, and the rest of the book builds upon what we find in the seven churches. Now, with that in mind, we need to study, before we look at Jezebel, we need to look at some principles of interpretation. Very important to look at these principles of interpretation. First principle, is that in our study of the church of Thyatira, we have to include the study of Revelation 11. In other words, when we study the fourth church, we need to also study Revelation 11, because Revelation 11 is an amplification of the period of Thyatira. So I'm giving here an illustration of what I just mentioned before, and that is that the rest of Revelation actually is an amplification of what we find in the seven churches. Now, not only do we need to study Revelation chapter 11 in connection with the fourth church, but we also need to study Revelation chapter 17, because in Revelation chapter 17, we have a great harlot who sits on multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. She's clothed like Jezebel. She kills the saints of the Most High. She's the mother, so she must have children. And so once again, you have the same scenario as the story of Jezebel during the 1260 years. And so in our study, we have to look at Revelation 11, which is a further amplification, and we need to look at Revelation chapter 17. 
That's the first principle that we need to keep in mind as we look at Jezebel. The second point that we need to remember as we study Jezebel is that Jezebel never appears alone. Jezebel always appears with the other protagonists of the story. You see when Jezebel appears Elijah must also appear because Jezebel was the enemy of Elijah. Also the false prophets of Baal must appear as well as Ahab. So when you find a repetition of the Old Testament story not only can you have Jezebel in the fourth church you also have to have all of the individuals that are in the story of Jezebel. Are you with me or not? Very important point because Jezebel never appears isolated. Jezebel always appears in the company of the other three which is the king Ahab, the false prophets that do the bidding of Jezebel and Elijah who proclaims the message against this union. Now the third principle that we need to keep in mind as we study uh, about Jezebel is that in the Bible there are four Elijahs so to speak. You say what? Four Elijahs? You got to be kidding me. What are the four Elijahs? First Elijah of course is the historical Elijah. The story is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18 primarily. The literal Elijah. And of course you be, uh, along with the literal Elijah you have Jezebel, you have Ahab the king, and you have the false prophets of the harlot and then of course they dominate the multitudes and the nations to enforce the worship of the sun god Baal on pain of persecution. So that's the first Elijah, it's the historical Elijah. But there's a second Elijah. That Elijah is John the Baptist. Jesus described John the Baptist as Elijah. Now this is not Elijah reincarnated mind you. This is not literal personal Elijah. This is someone who performs the same work that Elijah performed. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, Jesus says. Now who is that Elijah? That Elijah is John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist cannot appear alone, he's Elijah, so his enemies must appear with him in the New Testament. So when John the Baptist appears to do the work of Elijah, his enemies must also appear. You say, well where are his enemies? Have you ever read about the death of John the Baptist? Was there a king involved in the death of John the Baptist? What was his name? Herod. Was there an apostate mother who was committing fornication with the king? Yes, what was her name? Herodias. Did Herodias have a daughter who did the bidding of the mother? Yes, and it led to the death of John the Baptist. So are you seeing that John the Baptist, who is Elijah in the sense that he performs the work of Elijah, he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, he does not appear alone. He appears along with his enemies, which is Herod the king, like there was a king, Ahab, the mother, she's called the mother there in Mark chapter 6, who wants the death of John the Baptist, like you have Jezebel who wants the death of Elijah, and then you have the daughter who is equivalent to the false prophets who do the bidding of the mother. Are you with me or not? So that's the second Elijah. You say, where's the third Elijah? The third Elijah is the church during Thyatira. We've already noticed that in the fourth period of the church it says that Jezebel is at work. It is not literal Jezebel. Jezebel is symbolic, which must mean that there's not a literal king and there's not a group of literal false prophets and you know there, 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 there's, uh, you are not dealing with the literal. We're dealing with symbolic. Jezebel represents something beyond a literal person. Elijah represents something beyond a literal person. The false prophets or the daughter represents something beyond literal daughters. We're speaking, in other words, symbolic. What was literal in the Old Testament becomes symbolic. So the third Elijah is the, the Elijah during the 1260 years of the papal church. And of course, who was faithful Elijah during that period? It would be groups like the Waldenses and the Albigenses that proclaimed the truths of the Word of God. 
Let me ask you, were they hunted right and left by the apostate church of the 1260 years? Was the harlot drunk with their blood during the 1260 years? You better believe it. But you see, it's not a literal harlot, one lady. No, the harlot Jezebel represents an entire apostate church. Are you with me or not? So Elijah is not one person, Elijah is an entire group of people that proclaim God's message. The false prophet or the daughters are not literal daughters, it's speaking about churches that were born from the mother. Are you understanding the principle? Vital principle. Now who is the fourth Elijah? The fourth Elijah is the end time Elijah, because we're going to find that this prophecy in Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 tells us that before the great and terrible day of the Lord God is going to send Elijah again. It is not going to be a literal person, it's going to be a church or a movement that proclaims the same message that Elijah proclaimed. And this end time remnant church is going to proclaim a message of rebuke against Jezebel that represents an apostate church, her daughters that do what the mother says, and the kings of the earth that the harlot allies herself with. Are you with me or not? And so these are the principles that we need to keep in mind as we study this very important period of church history. Now let's take a look at the four protagonists of the Old Testament story. See, in typology, we're dealing here with typology. In other words, the literal people in the Old Testament represent systems later on. We're dealing with symbols, you're not dealing with the literal in the fulfillment. So let's take a look at the story of the Old Testament Elijah, which is the foundation for the other Elijahs that would arise. First of all, we have in the story of Elijah, Jezebel. What was Jezebel like? Was she a pretty determined lady? Did she have a mind of her own? You better believe she did. She knew exactly what she wanted. She wanted to extend the religion of the sun god in all of Israel. And she was going to get her way no matter what. That was the character of Jezebel. She hated Elijah and she wanted to kill him because he was rebuking her and her religion, the religion of the sun god. The second person that we have is Ahab the king. What kind of character did Ahab have? Well, Jezebel married Ahab. Was that a legitimate marriage? No, because God's people were not to get married with a pagan priestess. It was fornication, what the Bible calls fornication. So the king Ahab gets married with Jezebel, and what kind of character did he have? Did Ahab have a mind of his own? No. Whatever Jezebel said, the king did. He was a weakling. He was like Play-Doh. He would take the form that Jezebel wanted to give him. He did everything that Jezebel said. Are you catching the picture? Also we found the false prophets of Baal. This is the other uh, uh, group that we find here. Did the false prophets of Baal do exactly what Jezebel told them to do? Yes, she not only manipulated the king, she also manipulated the false prophets. And you say, how do we know that? Because the story tells us that the false prophets of Baal ate at Jezebel's table. She fed them, and you do not bite the hand that feeds you. They extended the religion of De Jezebel. They did what Jezebel told them to do. They would be equivalent to the daughters in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 17, which we will look at a little bit later. In other words, we have a relationship similar to what happened to John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist, the story, you can find it in Mark chapter 6. Did Herodias hate John the Baptist? Oh, she hated him with a passion. Why did, why did she hate him? Because, because John the Baptist rebuked her for fornicating with the king. He says, it not licit for you to take your brother's wife. In other words, she hated him because he rebuked fornication. 
So she was determined that she was going to get rid of John the Baptist, but she couldn't. Did she perhaps have like a deadly wound? She couldn't do it on her own? Yes. The story says that she could not. She wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. She needed help. So what does she do? Well, you remember that Salome comes in and dances, and the king has promised her up to half the kingdom for a dance. And now Herodias sees her opportunity. She says, aha, now's my chance. And so the daughter comes in and she says to the mother, by the way, she's called the daughter, and Herodias is called the mother, and Herod is called the king in the story. And so uh, Salome goes into the mother and she says, what shall I ask for a dance? And the mother says, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, was the daughter just like the mother? Did the daughter have the same spirit as the mother? Yeah. What would a normal daughter say? Mother, what are you talking about? The head of John the Baptist, give me a break. What did the daughter do? It says that immediately she said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Like mother, like daughter. Was the king a weakling king? Oh yes he was. Because, uh, you know, he, he was sorry that he had made the promise to give up to half the kingdom, whatever she asked, but he was too weak to say, I did wrong, because he didn't want to be embarrassed before all of the individ individuals that he invited to the banquet. Are you with me? So this story of the New Testament Elijah helps us understand the end time scenario. It is based on the story that we find in the Old Testament. So we have these four individuals or groups in the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. We have Jezebel, the strong-willed harlot woman who moves all the strings. We have Ahab, a weak and easily influenced king. We have the false prophets who are fed by Jezebel and they do everything that Jezebel says. And we have Elijah, God's faithful prophet who is called to denounce the evil triple alliance that is against him. Now, let me review this so it's absolutely clear. Jezebel was a literal pagan harlot. She literally married a king, a literal king. This literal king influenced her, uh, she influenced this literal king to introduce apostasy into Israel. The apostasy was a m literal mixture between the religion of the sun god Baal and the religion of Israel. She had a group of literal false prophets who extended her influence in the literal geographical territory of Israel and God raised a literal individual to denounce the apostasy. So in the Old Testament we are dealing with what? We are dealing with the literal. We're dealing with literal people who do literal things. Let me ask you, was the idolatry literal in the Old Testament? Yes. Did they worship the literal son? Yes. Are we dealing with literal Israel? Yes. Is Elijah a literal individual? Yes. Is Jezebel a literal individual? Yes. Is King Ahab a literal individual? Yes. Are the false prophets literally false prophets? Absolutely. So in the Old Testament the story is literal, but this literal story of the Old Testament then becomes symbolic of a church and the movements within that church. Are you with me or not? So let's summarize then the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. We'll summarize the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. First of all you have the harlot Jezebel. She fornicates with the king and uses his executive authority to extend her counterfeit religion. Is that, uh, is that a proper scenario of the story? We don't have time to go into the entire story. Second, she shed the blood of God's servants. It explicitly tells us in 1 Kings that she shed the blood of God's people and she wanted specifically to kill whom? She wanted to kill Elijah and silence his voice because he was rebuking her. The next point is that she was involved in the occult. 
Because we're going to notice that in 2 uh, Kings, she is called a witch. In other words, she was involved in the occult. Do you know what the basic uh, doctrine of the occult is? What does a witch do? A witch tries to conjure up the souls of the dead. Are you with me? And so if Jezebel's a witch, does she believe in the immortality of the soul? Yes. Does she believe that you can pray to the saints? And that you can ask the dead saints for favors? Is that true of the papacy during the 1260 years and even till today? Yeah. Absolutely. She was involved in the occult and she's called a witch. The next point is that she blended false worship uh, with the worship of the sun god Baal. Now in that time they worshiped the sun god Baal, the literal sun. But let me ask you, during the 1260 years, the church did not worship the literal sun, they worshiped on the what? On the day of the sun. And you say, now wait a minute, pastor, it's not the same to worship the sun as it is to worship on the day of the sun. And I sustain that in principle it's the same thing. You say, how's that? Let me explain. I might have explained this before. Who created the sun? God created the sun. Did he create the sun for worship? No. It's a secular object that gives us light. What happens if an individual makes the sun an object of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. Now let me ask you this. Who created the first day of the week? Who created the first day? God. Genesis says, it was the evening and the morning of the first day. God created the first day of the week. Did God create the first day of the week for worship? No. Is it a day of worship? No. no, the first day is not a day of worship, it's a day of work. Because God says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath or the day of rest. Are you with me? So let me ask you, what happens if a system tells us that Sunday is a day that God created for worship? What is that called? Idolatry. It doesn't matter whether it's an object that man creates for worship or a day that man creates for worship. In principle, it is the same thing. Man creating something for worship that God did not make for worship. Are you with me or not? Amen. That is the important principle. In other words, to a great degree, the papacy is an idolatrous system. And Protestant churches who follow in her footsteps are also practicing idolatry, and many of them don't even realize it. I'm not talking about individuals in the Protestant churches. You need to understand this. There are thousands upon thousands of sincere loving people in all of the Protestant churches. They love Jesus. Some of them are even more faithful than many Adventists. They live up to the light that they have. They don't realize that they're practicing idolatry, that the reason they keep Sunday is because the papal church established Sunday, not because the Bible tells us that Sunday is the day of worship. These people are sincere. They love Jesus. And if they are truly sincere, when they hear the truth, they say, this is the truth. I have to come out. I have to leave Babylon. I have to join God's remnant people because they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you understanding the issues, folks? So, in this story, she blends the true worship of the Lord with the worship of the sun god Baal. Does the papacy do the same thing? You better believe the papacy does the same thing. They themselves say, we embraced all kinds of pagan practices, but we claim to worship the true God. The next point that I want to mention is that Jezebel instituted a counterfeit sanctuary service, service or system. That's the reason why we're going to notice this in our second presentation, that Elijah, when he was on Mount Carmel, he had to repair the altar of the Lord where sacrifices were offered. Those sacrifices represented the coming sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In other words, the sacrificial system was destroyed. 
And Elijah was called to restore the altar and to restore the true sanctuary service. The next thing that we need to notice is that Jezebel taught the people to break the commandments of God. Elijah was called not only to restore true worship, he was called to restore the commandments of God. And you say, how's that? Well, you remember when Elijah met Ahab after the drought had caused severe problems in Israel, that uh, Ahab says to him, Oh, it's you, you troubler of Israel. In other words, you're to blame for everything that's happening in the kingdom. What does Elijah say? He says to Ahab, he says, Well, I'm sorry, Ahab, I'm just doing what God told me to do. <laughs> Is that what Elijah said? No, Elijah was bold. He was not politically correct. He didn't want to please the king. You know, preachers today, they just want to please people. Don't, don't tell Protestants that they're living in apostasy. and Don't tell the papal church that this is an apostate church, Jezebel. No, 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 that might offend someone. And what we, what we do is not offend people right into hell. Because the Bible tells us that those who remain within this system are going to be lost. The daughters who remain in the system are going to be lost. So it's not a loving thing to say, well, let's, let's not tell them these things because it might offend someone. It might make someone feel bad. No, people need to know these truths. They need to get out of these systems, these systems that do not teach the truth of God, these systems that have amalgamated apostasy with truth. Are you with me? Of course, we need to do it in a loving way. You know, this kind of reminds me of an experience that I had uh, at Fresno Central Church, I just arrived, this was in 1997, I did the first Cracking the Genesis Code series, and there was a couple that came to our church, uh, he uh, was an, had been an Adventist for many years, but had kind of gone astray, his father was a minister in Syria, uh, and then his father was expelled, so, um, you know, he came to Fresno, became a medical doctor, married this woman, and um, they came to the, to the meetings because they saw one of the brochures, and he of course had been an Adventist. They came to the first several meetings, they were really excited, they were pumped up, and then I preached about the little horn and about the heart of the Revelation chapter 17. He had no problems with it because he had been an Adventist, he knew all about this. But the wife had grown up in a convent, and she was deeply offended by the, the sermons that I presented, and she quit coming. And, uh, you know, once in a while after that she would come to church, but when she saw me coming towards her, she would make sure to take the closest detour so she wouldn't have to meet me. And when, when it was inevitable for her to meet me, uh, you know, she would just turn her head. She was really, really ticked off. Well, she kept on coming occasionally. And to make a long story short, the Lord allowed the message to sink in. And in the course of time, you know, she, she came to the conclusion that what I had said, it was hard, it was a hard saying, but that it was the truth. And so eventually, she was baptized into the Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she is one of the most active members in the church. She has several functions there in the church. Uh, her husband and her and their three daughters are as faithful as can be. One of the daughters plays the piano, they sing trios, I mean, super active in the church. Now, some of the members were after me. They said, see, you should have never preached those sermons because, look, they were coming, they were all happy, and now she quit coming. I said, give her time. Not a problem. You know, the truth hits people hard, and then they, when it sinks in, you know, they'll accept it. And, uh, and so that's exactly what happened. A few years later, she wrote me a card, which I still have in my file. By the way, she gave me permission to tell this story. And uh, in the card, she begged me forgiveness for all of the looks that she gave me. <laughs> you know, you have the example of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Did Stephen preach a powerful sermon? Was it politically correct? No. Oh no, he said, you were the ones who killed Jesus. You know, you're to blame for it. And how did they react? Oh, it says that their heart raged within them, and they gritted their teeth, and they wanted to kill him right then and there. And who was the ringleader? Saul of Tarsus. And he was really mad too. Because after the stoning of Stephen, he said, I'm going to go off and I'm going to go persecute the church in Damascus. But he knew that Stephen was right. The message hit him like a ton of bricks. 
and yet he knew that Stephen was right. And so he goes on the road to Damascus and the Lord knocks him to the ground with this bright light and he hears a message from heaven, a voice from heaven that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And of course Saul is thinking, I'm the, on the way to Damascus and this voice is coming from heaven, how am I persecuting you? Who are you? So that I know who I'm persecuting. And he was told by Jesus, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. In persecuting the church, Saul was persecuting Jesus. Because when you persecute the body of Christ, you're also persecuting the head of the body, which is Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, was it worthwhile for Stephen to preach that sermon? Yeah. Well, it got him killed, didn't it? Yeah. Got him killed. So he should have never preached that sermon. He should have been more diplomatic. He should have been more politically correct, right? No. Let me ask you, what was the result of Peter's sermon? The result of Peter's sermon was the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became the great apostle Paul. Was it worth it? Yes. How many people do you think are going to be in the kingdom as a result of the preaching of Paul? We have no way of knowing until we get to the kingdom. Millions. Because we're not only talking about the people that Paul met during his uh, time when he preached, we're talking about everyone who read his epistles and became a Christian by reading his epistles and became a believer through reading the writings of the Apostle Paul. Was it worth it? Yeah. You better believe it was worth it. But it made him mad. Doesn't matter if it made him mad. It made him mad because he knew that Stephen was right and he was telling the truth. Now how did I get off on this tangent? Well anyway, let's go back to the characteristics of the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. So did Elijah restore the commandments of God? He said, you have troubled Israel because you have forsaken the commandments of God and you are worshiping Baal. Did Jezebel have a group of literal false prophets that did her bidding, that did everything she said? Absolutely. What did God call Elijah to do? God called Elijah to unmask the apostate religion at the risk of his own life. Is that what happened during the period of the church of Thyatira? The Waldenses and the Albigenses, John Huss and others who proclaimed the gospel boldly, did they have to pay with the cost of their lives because this harlot church persecuted them and killed them? Absolutely. Now, what is the principle here? Literal Elijah, literal Ahab, literal Jezebel, and the literal prophets of Baal represent two stages of the church of Thyatira, symbolically. The first stage that the literal individuals of the Old Testament represent is the church during the 1260 years. That is Thyatira. The papal church, fornicating with the kings of the earth, daughters, Protestant churches born from her, persecuting those who preserve the true gospel. So that's the first fulfillment of the Old Testament story. The second fulfillment is going to take place at the very end of time. And you say, how do we know that what happened during the fourth church, during the period of papal supremacy in the past, how do we know that that story is going to be repeated in the end time? The answer is very simple. The Bible tells us that this ch fourth church, Thyatira, Jezebel, at the end of her period of dominion received a deadly wound. She was thrown into a sick bed. Remember what we read at the beginning? She was thrown into her sick bed. And those who fornicated with her were thrown into great tribulation, the French Revolution, which is the period when she received her deadly wound she received a deadly wound. Is that the end of her career? That is not the end of her career. Because Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3 tells us something very interesting. It says, I saw the beast, which is the same as the harlot, the Roman Catholic papacy during this period, I saw this beast that had a deadly wound, and its deadly wound was healed. 
And all the world worshipped and wondered after the beast. Is Jezebel going to resurrect? Is she going to be healed from her deadly wound? Yes. yes, the beast will resurrect. And so let me ask you, is Jezebel going to play a role in end time prophecy? Yes. Absolutely. Are her daughters going to play a role in end time prophecy? Yes. Are the kings of the earth going to play a role in this prophecy? Yes. Absolutely. Is God going to raise a people, Elijah, to restore the sanctuary, to restore the commandments of God, to restore worship to God on His holy Sabbath? Absolutely. That is exactly what is going to happen. Revelation chapter 17 tells us about this end time scenario. Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to end this first segment with these verses. It says there, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The wine is her false doctrines. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. This is Jezebel, by the way which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. How did Jezebel garb herself? Oh, she said he, she had her eyes painted up and everything. She, she was a harlot. And so this woman, this end time woman, which is a church, it says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And then it says in verse 5, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother. So she must have daughters, right? The mother of the harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And then verse 6 tells us, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Is that end time, Jezebel? That is end time Jezebel. And that is the Jezebel that we are going to discuss in our next presentation. What we're going to do is we're going to look more specifically at what Old Testament Jezebel did, compare it with what the church did during the 1260 years, and then take a look at what is going to happen when Jezebel resurrects from her deadly wound at the very end of time. I trust that you have been able to understand this presentation. You know, that, that's why I divided this into two parts, because there's no way you can do it in one part. So let's come together in a few moments for part number two.